Right now, let's uh, hand it over to Marjorie Raymer and the Congressman Gary Peters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, this is exciting. I am happy to be here tonight to ask the Congressman some questions. This is obviously a very important race. And just so everyone know, understands, I am the Director of News for MLive, and I'm actually representing an 18-member board that includes all eight of our newspapers, 10 newsrooms across the state, as well as our, our executive leadership. So this year we decided to open up the process to let everyone see what the candidates had to say. So thank you for joining us, Congressman. Uh, let's jump right in. Let's first talk about, obviously, the seat is open because U.S. Senator Carl Levin is leaving office. In what ways would you say that you would follow in his footsteps? In what ways would you say you would approach the office a little differently? Well, it's certainly, it's, uh, you know, I'm humbled to be running for the U.S. Senate, uh, given the fact that Carl Levin has been such an incredible U.S. Senator. Mm -hmm. uh, when he retires at the end of this year, it'll be 36 years of service, which uh, certainly is an incredible legacy. So, you know, trying to uh, compare that is uh, very, very tough. And, and certainly, I think uh, the world of Carl, he's always been a, a mentor for me. And I think the, the way he approaches the job is that he is very thoughtful uh, uh, and is always uh, concerned about what's happening uh, in Michigan and does it with 100%. Uh, integrity and uh, and that's uh, what certainly that uh, how I want to approach this job is that I believe that as a United States Senator the people of the state of Michigan need a vigorous advocate for middle-class families and for those who aspire in the middle class to, to go to Washington to fight for the things uh, that are important that's why I've been traveling all across the state of Michigan over the last year and a half from uh, from the UP to down in uh, the lower parts of the state all the places in between doing more listening than talking and really getting a sense of the, the great diversity that we have here in our state so we can hit the ground running and fighting uh, for issues that people care about. And, and the conversations that I think are, are most important uh, are those conversations that families have around the dinner table every night. That's about good paying jobs. I'm focused on the economy and making sure that if people are putting a good day's work in, they get a fair wage. And how do we grow that economy, diversify the economy? I'm sure you'll have more questions about that as the evening goes on. Also, people want to have access to affordable quality health care. They want to have education opportunities for their children, be able to live in safe neighborhoods. And when it's all said and done, after you've worked your whole life, to be able to retire with dignity and know that Social Security and Medicare will be there, as well as the other savings uh, that they have. So, you know, I, that is how, what, why I'm running for the, the Senate, and, and I believe we need to have practical, common sense uh, problem solvers in, in Congress that are just trying to find that kind of middle ground. I think Carl always tried to find that middle ground, and I look forward to, to doing that as well. So obviously, um, Senator Levin has carved out a niche for himself with national security. Where do you see yourself with national security, or, and where do you see your sort of specialty developing? Yeah, I think uh, you know, my, my focus uh, has always been about the economy and, and jobs. I think that's the number one issue. Certainly, it's the number one issue that I hear as I travel all across the state. Uh, I come from the business background. I spent 20 plus years in the investment world uh, and bring that business perspective uh, to public service. That's why when I was elected to the House of Representatives, I was assigned to the Financial Services Committee, which deals with anything related to the economy from banking, insurance, the stock market, the financial markets uh, generally. Uh, and, and I believe that's very important for Michigan, because Michigan, uh, although we certainly are very, uh, uh, and we'll talk about the auto rescue, was critical for us uh, to make sure we have a strong and vibrant auto industry, we also have to diversify that. Michigan still, unfortunately, is very high when it comes to unemployment. We're one of the highest unemployment uh, states, uh, or rates of unemployment of states in the country right now. So we want to focus particularly on small business, which has been my focus, making sure lending is available, for example. Uh, and, and, and that's uh, what I'd like to continue to do in the U.S. Senate is focus first and foremost on making Michigan's economy as strong as it possibly can. Obviously, as a senator, you're looking at the entire country's economy, but in the process, I believe Michigan has some very unique opportunities to be a leader. And how do we leverage that to make sure Michigan is, uh, continues to be the great state that it is? And you talked a moment ago about um, finding middle ground and um, referenced Senator Levin, who I, I don't think would normally be considered a middle ground <clears throat> sort of senator. Um, and also in your television ad, you talk about yourself as an independent leader. I guess, can you give examples of where uh, you, you think you differ from the Democratic Party or differ from President Obama's policies? Well, I, there are a number of things. I mean, uh, and if you look at how people are ranked, there are, there are uh, the National Journal, for example, ranks members of Congress based on an ideology of uh, conservative, uh, liberal, or moderate. I've been consistently ranked as the most moderate 
member of not only the Michigan delegation, but one of the most moderate members uh, of Congress. So I think you're right that uh, Carl Evan wouldn't be in that category. So I'm uh, considered, uh, you know, if you kind of look at my philosophical thinking, it's probably from a, on a fiscal standpoint more conservative. When it comes to money issues, I want to make sure we have full accountability. We're spending money wisely, uh, that government is working efficiently, and that's why I've introduced legislation to streamline government, get rid of inefficiencies, uh, and reduce uh, some of the burdensome costs that you have when you have multiple agencies. So that's uh, where I come from, from more of a fiscally uh, conservative. But on uh, certainly on social issues, I'm uh, very uh, progressive and have uh, been a champion for environmental issues, for example, LGBT rights, other types of issues uh, from uh, on the social side that um, put me as much more progressive. So wh what ways so far in Congress do you would you point to that you've actively worked across the aisle successfully to get things done with the Republicans in Congress? Uh, oh, an example of where we do it? Well, I think, you know, when we go back to the autos, uh, the area that uh, I focus uh, primarily on. I, I am co-chair of the auto caucus uh, in the House of Representatives, which uh, is uh, a caucus that are focused on making sure the auto industry is strong and vibrant. Uh, since I've been the co-chair uh, and I work with a Republican, John Campbell, who's a Republican from California, uh, we have increased the membership of that organization uh, dramatically. We now have, I, I believe we have over 60 members now. Uh, half are Republicans, uh, half are Democrats. It's very important to show that it truly is bipartisan. Uh, and we've also I've expanded it not only from a partisan standpoint, but also from a regional standpoint. My co-chair, my Republican co-chair, for example, is from California. Uh, in the past, an auto caucus was uh, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, and uh, we have to understand this is a national industry, which really became quite apparent when we went through the auto crisis, that we had a, folks had to understand this had implications, not just in the Midwest, but across the entire nation. And so I've diversified it that way, as well as bringing Republicans and Dems together. I just passed legislation with a Republican colleague of mine to streamline some of the paperwork. For example, when you buy a new car, you're probably... If, Remember, you got a stack of paper like this that you have to fill out all sorts of forms. Uh, there are forms that have been there for years and folks can't really justify them anymore. And we actually streamlined, we got rid of some of the paperwork that people have to fill out to make business work more efficiently and reduce cost. Uh, the frustrating thing is it actually took an act of Congress to do that, which is another <laughs> issue that we've got to talk about. Uh, but we did it and we were able to get bipartisan support and, and broad support to do that. You know, it's a small bill, but it is really a, a step forward in what we have to do. We have to bring people together on both sides of the aisle to get things done. And that's why I look forward uh, for the U.S. Senate, because we are seeing examples of that in the Senate. Immigration reform, for example, started when you had four Republicans and four Democratic senators came together, eight, that put together a proposal in a bipartisan way that passed the Senate. You know, that's the, the kind of thing we have to do. It's what I've done in the House and what I look forward to do in the Senate. So the perception is often, when talking about Congress, though, that it is just so divided. Um, do you think that that impression isn't accurate, or um, what have you done to, to change that? I mean, we, we're talking about a couple of key things, but it, it seems like still overall the, the mood is very... Um, not good, I guess. No, it's, uh, and, and uh, certainly the American people are frustrated with it, as they should, and, and, and I'm frustrated uh, because that's not, uh, you know, I'm from a business background, and it's, not a, it's about trying to find how we solve these kinds of issues uh, to bring people together. Part of that is building relationships, which I have worked. It's why in the Auto Caucus, uh, Mr. Campbell, who I'm the co-chair with, we've also worked on legislation to, to deal with Freddie and Fannie and re do major mortgage reform uh, together. Uh, there are other members I'm working uh, uh, with uh, Representative Gardner now out of Colorado dealing with making government more efficient uh, and we're bringing bipartisan co-sponsors on that legislation together. So the key thing is, is to reach uh, across the aisle and develop some personal relationships because then that starts to transcend. So like the, the auto bill that I mentioned, I mean those are the relationships we build from, from doing that allows us then to deal with more complex legislation that's going to require middle ground because you gotta, you got to build trust. And that takes some time. Unfortunately, you do have a lot of folks, though, in Congress who are very ideological. They're either far right or far left, and, and they aren't looking at things in the broader perspective. And those folks are harder to, to pull together, uh, but there's still enough uh, folks in the middle. We just have to continue to, to work to, to build those kinds of bridges. Let's go back to immigration reform, too, that you mentioned. Um, where do you stand on that? Where do you think we should go next? Well, I support the, uh, I mentioned the Senate bill. I support the uh, the Senate bill that came out uh, in a bipartisan fashion, as I mentioned. And it was really circumvented any of the leadership. You had these eight senators that came together to, to craft that piece of legislation. Uh, and uh, and then pass it, and you had uh, you had broad support. You have two 
Republican senators, uh, Mr. McCain and Mr. Rubio from, from border states that supported that immigration reform. You have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that's supporting uh, that reform. It's uh, one that I support as well, and I support it because it's comprehensive is what we need. It certainly deals with border security, which is very important. There's uh, $40 billion of uh, border security money, uh, part of the immigration reform, but also deals with all the other issues that we have to deal with, uh, whether it's uh, we're making sure that highly skilled workers can come into our country that may have skills that we don't have here, and make sure that those uh, visas are available so they can bring their talents here. And, and you know, America has always been great because the best and brightest from around the world, wants, they want to come to the United States to, to pursue the American dream and to contribute to our economy. We've got to continue that energy that's growing. We've got to make sure we deal with some of the problems with the agricultural community. Michigan is a big agricultural state. We have the second most diverse agriculture next to only to California. I mean, we are blessed with an incredible agricultural sector and folks there will tell you all of the problems that they have bringing in the workers that they need to get those crops from the field uh, in, into the store. But I, I think we, we should embrace uh, the opportunities here, especially when it comes to entrepreneurs and people investing. You know, it's important to remember that of the Fortune 500 companies, the biggest companies we have uh, in this uh, country, uh, over 20% were founded by immigrants. And if you look at venture capital money now, of investing in new companies that are being created and creating jobs, the same, it's 20, 30% are immigrants or sons of immigrants or, or daughters of immigrants uh, that have formed those, those companies. So uh, I'd rather have those people in the United States creating jobs than us uh, looking for, for opportunities in other countries and, and outsourcing jobs. We need to bring those jobs here into America, bring that intellectual talent, that hardworking talent, the very vitality that has made this country so great is because people have come from all over the world to make this country great. We've got to continue to do that and, uh, and take the politics out of it. Unfortunately, people try to demonize it and bring politics into it. This should not be about that. It should be just simply what's right for our country. And that's why I support the, uh, the Senate bill. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And what about climate change? Do you believe it is a problem? And can you explain your position? Uh, it, is, uh, it is a problem. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, and uh, the science is very clear that uh, humans uh, contribute significantly to the problem. And therefore, we have to have some public uh, policy solutions uh, to that. Uh, and I think there are a number of ways uh, that we need to deal with it. You've got to set goals of how we reduce carbon emissions from the economy generally. I also believe that it presents an incredible opportunity for us here in Michigan as well. We've got some incredible companies that are leading the world when it comes to alternative energy, reducing carbon, making sure energy is more sustainable, whether it's wind or solar. We're actually one of the leading solar producers uh, in the world, or in the country rather, in the country right here in Michigan. A lot of people I don't realize that, and, and I grew up here. I've, I'm a fifth generation Michigander. I know we have a lot of clouds here in our state, but we actually produce a great deal. Dow Chemical Company, for example, is creating solar shingles. That is an innovative product, creating jobs in Michigan uh, that is uh, generating opportunity for us while also doing what's right for the planet. You, know, you can do what's good for business. You can do what's good for planet. They aren't mutually exclusive. You can do them both together. Uh, and there's incredible opportunities uh, for us uh, in this state uh, to, to be the leader. In fact, back when some of the, uh, when I was a professor, uh, before I actually did a forum on climate change, and the title of my forum was, Can Climate Change Heat Up Michigan's Economy? And we had folks from the business community coming in and talking about all the incredible ways that they can grow the economy in Michigan while dealing with the significant challenge of climate change. So is there any legislation, is there any Senate action, congressional action that you think should specifically address the problem of, of climate change? Well, certainly we should continue to incentivize those kinds of new technologies to make sure that they're coming online and get the startup capital that they need. Uh, but also, I think we need to set targets to reduce uh, carbon emissions. There have been recent EPA rules uh, that have been announced, uh, although I do have some concerns uh, with those rules as they apply to Michigan. We've got to make sure they work for Michigan. Uh, and I've raised those concerns that uh, although we have to set targets, and it's important to do that, uh, you've got to make sure those targets are achievable. Uh, and you also have to make sure that Michigan isn't put at a competitive disadvantage. Right now, those EPA rules, I believe, uh, put us at a disadvantage with some of the other Midwestern states that don't have as high a target as we have. And partly it's because we're a little ahead of the curve, but we shouldn't be punished because we're ahead of the curve. Uh, we should uh, make sure that those rules uh, are going to apply uh, more equally and fairly for all the Midwestern states. And then I've also uh, have uh, made a statement on those EPA rules, similar to with the fuel efficiency standards that passed 
uh, a while back as well on automobiles, that as we set those goals, we should have a midterm review where we take a look at where we are, uh, are we achieving those goals, are they, are they being done in a cost-effective way, is the technology is there, so we can really make sure that uh, we're doing it in a proper way. And also understand, I mean, one thing about these rules, they set uh, goals for 2030, is that we're not going to get there in a linear way. You know, it's going to it's going to take time to to make these changes, and some of them may occur later as opposed to sooner. And we have to have that reflected to make sure the rules work accordingly. So that we need to have, I guess, in, in one word, <laughs> there has to be flexibility. Okay, thank you. Uh, now let's bring it back to the state a little. Let's bring it back to Michigan specifically a little bit. Um, after the bankruptcy proceedings in Detroit, um, what do you think is the next step for Detroit? Well, uh, the next step is to make sure that we continue to uh, uh, in our investing and making it possible for folks to invest in the city, because the city has to grow. Yeah, if, if it doesn't grow, we're going to be in a situation where we are now, uh, and revenues will, be, will decline if people continue to leave the city, and we'll be back in a situation where you may need, uh, you know, need to take some extraordinary action again. So you have to grow the city. So it's about economic development. And certainly at the federal level, I work to make sure that we have an opportunity to get federal grants that are available. They have to be done with complete accountability to make sure when we bring in federal money that it's spent wisely and is uh, being used appropriately. But that means we make sure that we have grants to, we have safe streets, uh, public safety grants, transportation grants, uh, economic development grants are important. The one area that I'm particularly focused on and one that I'm very passionate about is transportation. We need to have a transit system that works uh, for regular folks and everybody as well. And we know the economic development that occurs as a result of that. That's why I work for the M1 Rail, to, which is an important project with uh, light rail uh, from downtown Detroit uh, out to uh, the new center area. And, uh, you know, and we know that when you build something like that, it's like a magnet uh, for growth. Although I also believe that if it stops at uh, the, the Midtown area, it'll fail. It's got to go all the way to Pontiac. And we've got to have a regional system like every other major city in America. We have to have regional <laughs> transit system. Uh, here uh, in, in our state, and uh, that means working together with local, state, uh, and federal resources to move people around. And I just, if I may, and this may take a little while, but I think it's an important story to really kind of encapsulate the, the challenges of folks in the city of Detroit. I represent half the city, and, and uh, I take that seriously, and that means uh, I spend time riding around on DDOT buses to get a sense of what people go through every day in their lives as they're riding those buses. And, I, and I've heard a lot of stories as I talk to folks. But one story that I will never forget, and I think encapsulates a lot of what I heard, uh, the one morning I was riding on the bus, there was a woman there who was coming back from work, and I asked her about her daily life. She, uh, she lives in the city of Detroit, and she uh, works in the city of Detroit. It takes her a little over an hour and a half to get to work, all in the city. She works all night. The next morning, she, or, and then she goes back an hour and a half to go home. That's when I saw her, she was on her way home. And then when she got home, she was gonna wake up her two young daughters, feed them breakfast, and then get on a bus with them because she wanted to send them to a different school across town. It would take her 45 minutes to get them to school. She would drop them off, ride the bus 45 minutes home, go to bed, she worked all night, wake up, go 45 minutes to go collect her daughters, and then 45 minutes home. She spent over six hours a day on a bus. And she said all she dreamed about was that her daughters would have a better life than she did. She was working so hard, she didn't have any time for herself. To me, this is an economic issue, but it is a moral issue as well, particularly in a city where a third of the folks don't have access to automobiles. We have to have a transit system to empower folks to be able to, to, be able to live lives and, and bring more people into the city to grow those cities. So it's that story that is with me every day, and that's why I fight to make sure that we're bringing resources in and, and trying to build the public-private partnerships necessary to grow this city so that people have opportunities and have the ability to live that American dream and to ensure that that woman that was on the bus that day, that her children will truly have an opportunity to do much better. That's, to me, the, the very basic tenet of the American dream. Thank you, and I, I would ask everyone again to please hold your applause. We appreciate your enthusiasm, but uh, let's try to get through as many questions as possible. One, one topic that you didn't mention just there, and I was a little surprised, was actually blight and um, blight funding. How important and relevant is that, and how much can you do about it, I guess is the bottom line, um, if elected to the Senate. Yeah, in fact, I want to, if I could mention too, I mean, blight funding is certainly important. I mean, in the, in the city now, I, I believe the last number I saw is close to, 80,000 structures, 70, 80,000 structures need to be uh, demolished. So that's going to take uh, tremendous uh, effort. 
uh, and resources. Uh, we've been able to redirect some of the hardest hit federal funds to help uh, efforts that are being done at the state and local level to, to do that. So that process has to go. And we've got to be uh, very systematic about it and find those areas uh, where you can have, uh, particularly in, in, in neighborhoods where you may have a few buildings that have fallen into disrepair that are then bringing down the value of the entire neighborhood. Those need to be prioritized, and we're seeing that now, and the mayor has certainly been very focused on that and using those harder to hit funds uh, to knock that down. But, uh, but ultimately, it's still about bringing, after you do that, it's still about bringing people into the city. And in addition to transit, I mean, the other thing, if I may briefly say, too, that I've been working on is to make sure that uh, the, the new international bridge, which I think is absolutely critical uh, for us, for our state, uh, and for, for really the country, uh, needs to go forward. And I've been working on uh, getting the federal funding for the, the customs plaza. Right now, as I'm sure you're aware, the Canadian government is fronting all the money for, for the bridge. Uh, although they aren't really anxious about funding, funding uh, the plaza that houses all the U.S. government officials, thinking the, the U.S. government should pay for that for our Border Patrol and Customs people. And so uh, we're working to get that funding to get that project moving forward. Because really, Detroit, when you think about where we are, and Michigan, really, it's not just about Detroit, it's really about our whole state. Uh, we need to be the logistics capital for the Midwest, and it's our geographic position. We are smack dab in the middle between Chicago and Toronto. And throughout human history, if you're located on an international border between two major financial powerhouses, which we have in Chicago and Toronto, you flourish. So how do we do that? That certainly the bridge is important. I'm also working to get funding uh, and work in public, private, uh, with private companies as well for a new railroad bridge as well that will make us a major corridor for transportation between Canada and the United States. Uh, that will bring more economic activity into Detroit. It will bring more people into Detroit but it'll also help the entire state of Michigan. It's not just Detroit. This is about the whole state of Michigan. I want to talk, touch on a topic that's brought, been brought up in a few of our other ballot bashes here. Uh, Michigan veterans actually rank 53rd per capita in, I have to look at my stats there, 53rd per capita in receiving federal dollars um, for total veterans benefits when compared to the 50 states. Um, Puerto Rico, D.C., Guam, all of them. So pretty bad. What can you do about that? I mean, I'm just going to go on the assumption you think we should be ranking higher. Um, and if that's true, what, what can you do about it? Uh, there's no question, and, and I, I take that very seriously. You know, I served in the, in the U.S. Navy Reserve and, uh, and want to make sure that uh, our veterans get the, the benefits that they have earned uh, and that they uh, deserve. Uh, and so part of that is uh, also education to make sure veterans know. We've, I've held in my office uh, uh, forums uh, where veterans can come and, and hear from the different uh, government agencies that may have uh, benefits that are available if you're a veteran, whether it's you know mortgage or other kinds of uh, benefits that you can get. Part of that is that education process, and so I think we need to continue to do that. Uh, particularly, uh, some some of the vets that have been out for a while uh, are not really aware of some of the things that the, they are entitled to. But also, I mean, the other thing that I really have been taking very personally is to step up for the VA as well to make sure our veterans get the health care that they deserve as well. And so, uh, you know, I was certainly very concerned about what we saw with the VA. I've known that problem. I mean, the kinds of cases we get, and I, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we, these are cases that are extremely important. I have veterans that come to my congressional office who want to get into the VA, and because of the bureaucracy, have a very difficult time doing that. And uh, we focus on helping those veterans, and I'm happy to say we're able to get those veterans in the VA. But every time we do that, I get so frustrated because you should not have to go to a member of Congress to get into the VA. You shouldn't have to do that. It should be a seamless approach uh, to do it. That's why I was uh, one of the first Democrats to call for uh, uh, Director uh, or uh, Secretary Shinseki to uh, resign for what happened with the VA. We've got to do a better job of making sure that system works for our men and women who have served, put themselves in harm's way, making sure they have what they takes, but also hold them accountable, that veterans need to have the ability to get in in a seamless way and get the care that they certainly deserve uh, and uh, have earned. Right. Um, we're going to go into a little bit of a speed round here okay. so that we, we can uh, get in a, a few more questions before we run out of time. Uh, let's, let's go for, uh, let's see, four questions in about two minutes. You won't really be time, but just oh, okay. to give you a, give you a pace here. Uh, what's the best policy regarding gun control for the federal level? And they're big questions. So <laughs> That's right. <laughs> go for it. Is, uh, is question number two world peace? Just so yes. I just want to make sure. <laughs> just, exactly. just getting ready for it. So uh, we got it. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, what's the best uh, for gun legislation? Uh, I think we got oh, gun guns. control policy. I, I support, yes. uh, and, I, and I'm, a, I'm a gun owner, but mm -hmm. I support uh, universal background checks. So we need to move that forward. Uh, it is something, there's two larger loopholes now that allow people to buy weapons uh, without having a background check. It is, uh, it is one of the sources of my frustration in Congress in the fact that this is a policy that is supported by over 90% of the American people, uh, okay. and yet uh, it has not had a vote. Well, I'm going to keep pushing to get a vote on the floor. Okay, so universal background. You did pretty good. Universal background checks. Okay, in your view, is the U.S. Supreme Court too liberal, too conservative, something in between? What do you think? Well, uh, the, the, uh, I, I'm concerned about some of the uh, recent uh, decisions, so we'll put it at that. I mean, I, I am beyond – so one of the decisions – and now that, that I've run this race for the U.S. Senate, I'm particularly dismayed by the Citizens United case uh, that the Supreme Court uh, passed, which allows unlimited funds coming into campaigns. We've got to take all this money. We can't have these out-of-state billionaires and others that are putting all those monies in the campaign. Uh, the court uh, – I'm very disappointed by that, and I was also disappointed by their recent – a Hobby Lobby decision in which says that a, that a woman doesn't have control over her reproductive health, her boss has it. To me, I think that is absolutely outrageous. Women should be able to make decisions about their reproductive health, not their bosses. So those are very troubling decisions, and uh, we'll see how okay. we move forward. So, so too liberal, too conservative, or... Or something in between. Well, yeah. Well, those those are not so good one, decisions. <laughs> okay. Um, what name one uh, one policy one tax policy change? What, give me one one if you think the U.S. should change tax policy. What would what would your first priority be? Well, I just uh, in fact I, I just uh, recently uh, voted was one of the few Democrats to vote for this. And actually, uh, related to the other question, uh, the president offered a veto threat, but I think he was wrong, and that was to put the research and development tax credit, make that permanent. Uh, I'm, uh, I also serve on the Innovation Caucus. In addition, I'm co-chair of the Innovation. I believe we've got to grow our economy. We've got to invest in research and development. And when we do that and use the incredible intellectual powers we have in this country, we are going to prosper. And that's why we need a permanent research and development credit put into the tax code so that companies and, and individuals can make the long-term kind of plans they need for long-term research and development. Uh, last of the speed round, then we'll do a final question for you. Um, what about, don't you think Michigan voters deserve to see the candidates debate? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we should have a debate. And uh, I've been calling for a debate since June uh, and was hoping we could uh, have these discussions in June and July because I know it's always tough to do those things uh, in October. Uh, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. And I'm, I've, I've said this publicly, I'll keep saying it. That this should be a, a town hall format where the people of the state of Michigan have the opportunity to ask the question. And I, we don't, I'm tired of negotiations. I'm tired of all that stuff. Let's just have a debate exactly as the gubernatorial debate, town hall format. Undecided voters uh, should be able to ask their questions of the candidates and see us on the stage interacting with, uh, uh, like any town hall, which is an important part of being a, a U.S. senator. Uh, if it's good enough for the two uh, gubernatorial candidates, it should be good enough for the Senate. Let's uh, bring it on. All right, final question. Um, if elected, how will you personally judge whether or not you've been successful? Well, in your uh, first term. In my uh, first term, right. successful. Incentive. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, the, the success is, is certainly some legislative success, but it's also your ability to, to be out, be in the community, uh, hearing from folks all across the state, solving problems. I think it's very important, you know, something that doesn't get uh, talked about a lot, but is constituent service too, to make sure that government works for people. Uh, you know, I pride ourselves, our, our office uh, works very diligently to make sure that we're taking care of issues for, for people who are facing, whether it's uh, not getting Social Security or having disabilities, all sorts of issues that come up and they find it difficult to navigate that. I take that very seriously. I think we, we need to, to do that. And if we have an effective office that's, that's solving people's problems, uh, I think that is, uh, is a success. But then I'm also going to be focused on making sure that uh, we continue to grow Michigan's economy. I think that is uh, very important, as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, uh, interview, uh, that it's the economy is the most important thing. People want to have good paying jobs, and I'm going to continue to work uh, to strengthen uh, manufacturing, strengthen the auto industry, but also work to strengthen small business to make sure small businesses can grow and prosper. But also the same token, uh, I also believe the agricultural sector is so important in Michigan. Uh, I worked on uh, making sure that the farm bill moved forward. I worked with Senator Debbie Stabenow, who I think did an outstanding job in moving forward that bill. And I'm committed to uh, traveling around the state and working very closely with uh, the agricultural sector and the farmers in this great state. Great. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Peters. <laughs>